Thank you, Brittany. And it shows me. I can see your go. You're connected to GoToWebinar screen. Okay. Thank you. I'm sorry. It's the wrong screen here. And I'm sorry. Let's go. Or is that the right screen? I can see your PowerPoint. We just, um, it, it's not in presentation mode. Oh, yeah, it's on my other screen. I'm sorry. And Okay, I'm sorry, it's at, um, it's sitting on the wrong screen, I'm sorry. Let me just. It's okay. Is it on the correct screen there? It's still just showing us the, the um, not in presentation mode, but if you just go down and click on the slide and, and play it, I think we should be fine. Yeah, it's, on, it's showing on my, because I just kept the extra monitor there. Okay. Is it on this? Did it uh, move over? No. Okay. Sorry, let's go here. Now, oh, sorry, I gotta move that over. Now we can see your email. There we go. Perfect. Okay, and then we'll get caught up. Sorry, apologize for the, the delay there. Okay, well, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where you have to be sitting today. Uh, today we're gonna go over the curious case of UDO usage and security. Uh, we're gonna go over the many benefits of UDOs and also the power and the potential for fraud and abuse that can exist uh, with uh, UDOs. So we have to be very aware of what we use it for. <clears throat> we'll be covering uh, the UDOs, uh, things that you may or may not consider that are hidden in plain sight. Uh, the obvious always remains unobserved because it's obvious. Uh, then we'll go over some things to ponder. And uh, last, we will cover uh, some JD, I'm sorry, J GSI security offerings. What is a UDO? <clears throat> One of the new buzzwords. Enterprise One has made available a new way of customizing a user experience. Uh, Using UDOs, which are user-defined objects, uh, you follow the OMW process with something we're all familiar with. You create, approve, and promote a customized display uh, for end users to have, be more effective and functional in their uh, jobs. So there's a variety of different things we could do with that. These composite shortcuts can combine the functionality, uh, separate programs into one view, which is pretty neat how we can continue customizing. 
The different types of VDOs that currently exist, uh, the first one, the basic one, are the queries. They could be very simple or very complex, and they could be integrated into a single page. For example, if you're a financial person and you want up-to-date numbers for uh, running totals or anything at any point in time, you can create a, a page just for that. If you have, for example, currency exchanges, you want to know what the rates of exchange are, this would be one handy tool. You can create a UDO just to do that. So there's a variety of things, you know, your imagination, it, it could be, uh, you could use it pretty powerfully for that. Uh, the next type of UDO would be uh, for enter one pages. This would be kind of your starting page for the user if you want to give them exactly what they need and nothing that they don't. So you can create a, a portal page for them. They jump in and all the buttons are there just for what they need. And lastly, you can do uh, the composite uh, application framework, which is CAFE 1. And this we can uh, plug into external programs. For example, if you want to be back to the, uh, the query for the financial person, you could do currency exchanges. If you are running some type of um, outdoor shop, uh, weather might be in, uh, something that you need to be aware of, you know, hurricanes down here in Florida, for example. You can have that up on your uh, page and you know what's coming and the weather, it could be uh, monitored right from your desktop. So again, these different types of UDOs are very customizable and uh, it's very powerful in what we could do with them. Now, the, the one downside would be your compliance and auditing efforts. Because remember, whenever you grant any access to programs, we have to ensure that we don't violate any uh, SODs or any kind of conflicts or in some sensitive areas, HR, for example. You want to be very careful how you build your UDOs out because you have to grant access to those programs that you want the, the user to have access to. And this is where your auditing, your compliance teams, they have to be aware of what you're doing so then you don't build something that may be fantastic, but it violates some sort of SOX or even in some in some shops if you have GMP considerations. Uh, if you have manufacturing, for example, you have to be very aware of what access and who gets what. So there's it's a fine balancing act so that you have to work with your teams and make sure everybody's understanding of what's going on and what's going to be introduced. So these are pretty important and so much so that I think that if you have a change advisory board, some type of CAB meeting, these kinds of changes are presented there because they would impact everybody or many people. So it's just something to keep in mind there. Now we consider our, our current events right now, we have a, a pandemic that's running around. Uh, many of us are probably working from home right now. Uh, so there's a great deal of pressure to produce medicines, PPEs, medical devices, or any sort of other uh, manufacturing um, products. Sometimes when you get into those rushes, you can skip through things faster than you need or you should, and you can compromise your system. So be very aware of the impacts of what we do. That's where the compliance teams and your audit, they have to be aware of what's going on. And this brings us to the, with a great power comes great responsibility. And that was a French National Convention, uh, 1793. Uh, it was not actually Peter Parker's father from Spider-Man. So I just wanted to put that out there for everybody. Uh, we're gonna visit two scenarios here that are true. And uh, they did, they did, I did witness them at two client sites that I was at many years ago. And this is after Back then it was JDE released uh, 21 CFR part 11 tools that auditing became a tool within JDE 7332. Prior to that, it was, uh, it was left up to the devices of the organizations to do so. But uh, in these scenarios that I'm gonna go to be recounting, the specifics have been changed a little bit here, but the methodology is still viable and even more pertinent today than maybe it was back then. So something to uh, consider here real quick. 
we have the, some background information. We have the customer service representative is uh, one of your leading points of contact to all the users. Uh, it's essential that you limit how many times customers are transferred with issues. And this is uh, an important issue, thing to resolve. And I am sorry here for a second, but um, and I'm sorry. It's uh, I'm sorry. Am I on the right screen again? Because uh, I think this presentation is incorrect. I'm so, forgive me for uh, just a moment. Yeah, it's, um, you're on the hiding in plain sight slide. Okay, yes, there's the, um, and, and this would be the, Okay, I'm sorry, I'll just go with, uh, with, um, and there it goes, I'm sorry. Uh, you know, our CSRs are the ones that um, they'd, you want the one call to have the users or your clients call in and have one call to resolve the issues. So one handy thing to do is to provide uh, a, a UDO that would give them access, for example, to update address book, first tier support type of thing. This includes contact names, numbers, emails, etc. And these are very nice to have because you can, you know, change phone numbers, emails, contacts, and then the client's happy. There's one phone call, then their issue goes away. They they uh, should be happy with the the work that was done. Now. We have, in this case, there's a gentleman called Joe in the accounts payable group. He sees the, the screens and thinks this is very exciting. This will make my job much easier. Now we take a look at Joe. Joe's a, an AP clerk. He's responsible for printing checks. Uh, he runs the check register. He checks, make sure that uh, there's printer in the uh, paper in the printers. He gets a uh, prints checks, collates them, stuffs them, and sends them off in the mail. Uh, for some organizations, this is still a uh, a normal practice unless you have an external company to do your your check printing for you. Uh, you know, Joe would also get um, the checks are all uh, printed with signatures and all that. So this is a pretty secure approach in the old older architectures. This is very common. But now let's imagine if uh, Joe receives his access uh, to the CSM uh, UDO, which grants uh, maintenance of address book. You know, Joe can go into the uh, address book and he can change the um, alpha name in the address book for a check that he knows is going to be printed. Uh, it could be a small amount, a few hundred bucks or so. Or so. Uh, he changes it, he prints the checks out then it can go back in and change the alpha name back to whatever it is it was before. Uh, he's got to check with whatever name he wants on it right now. Since he owns all that, he can go ahead and process. And, um, and nobody's the wiser at that point in time. Uh, the issue becomes where a company issues hundreds of thousands of checks in a month for various purposes. Uh, this is kind of a needle in the haystack event. Uh, by the time that the uh, person that's supposed to receive the check calls to complain, they may not have, um, you know, a you know net 60 in you know, net 90 days, whatever. There's no discounts, so then they have to get a new check out to the customer. Uh, a new check is issued. If uh, there's a review process for that uh, endeavor, then they'll say, okay, the check was forged. We'll write it off because as it is, you know, as some organizations, depending how big you are, you may have the uh, capacity to write off X amount of dollars on a month. It's like a spoilage or a shrinkage, it's gone. 
So a new check is found, uh, a new check is printed, sent out to the customer, and uh, you chalk it up to, okay, that happens. So there's usually typically no uh, backlash after that. Here we have another uh, account, which is um, we have Steve. Steve uh, also works in um, in the sales area. He creates accounts for their website. You know, the website access uh, provides customers uh, with on stock, on hand in stock, and uh, current customer pricing. So these are very handy for managers and supervisors who have the access to quick and need to know, I order some stuff to get it to my procurement team so they can praise the PO for me, since not everybody can generate POs within the organization. So Steve will create that account for people, so I let them get in there. Unfortunately, Steve has, uh, which some years ago, this was not even an issue, but it's more and more prevalent. He has a social media presence. Uh, some time ago, you could say that, well, people would go to restaurants, take a picture of their food or their family gatherings and put it on their social media. That's what it was intended for. Uh, but now Steve has a social media presence. Uh, when he creates the address book entries, they have a cat code, for example, and they represent web or inquiry access. And you would think from an administrative point of view, that's rather innocuous. There is no harm there's no risk in having that account out there because it's web and inquiry what harm right but steve for a small fee can get his customers copies of users to customers that uh his clients may want so he can create a copy of a purchasing agent from x company and sells it to y company and now we think that Okay, that's maybe not a big deal, except Y company may come in there and says, I know what the prices are. I can underbid that company, the X company, and take that sale away from them. So yes, yeah, there is some potential there for fraud. So something that very innocently can be swept under the cover. And who monitors that? You know, those types of accounts, you know, if it's just an inquiry. But again, something like that so small, it uh, it can produce an issue. And uh, before we go into this, I have the first quick question. That's the uh, like our game show here. And I wanted to uh, bring up. A poll, is my poll showing up there? It is. Okay. You know, I'm sorry, this is uh, UDOs, you know, are they used within your organization? You know, how often do you, uh, you know, your prevalence of UDOs? We'll give her for a couple seconds there. Yeah, that's about a minute there. Uh, it's, interestingly enough, uh, it's about 56% are minimal. Uh, usage, which is one to two per person, uh, which is the the middle of the road. Thirty three percent says it's uh it's medium. So you have about a third of our uh, of our invitees right now say so three to five. So it's kind of a semi extensive uh, use, and uh, eleven percent are knee deep in it. And there's about uh, six or more per person of UDOs. So that's pretty significant usage of uh, this tool. So that's how widespread it be within your organization, which is very interesting. Now, as, as far as the 56% are, are minimal usage people, is there, uh, let me see, 
if there's any other um, are you considering using uh, you know for those who, who are in the 56 percent number is there a, a plan for using more of UDOs and wow that's pretty so far within six months or years about is winning pretty heavily there So it's pretty exciting the um, this new tech and how we can uh, expand the the power of JD or Enterprise One. Okay, we'll let this bull run for a few more minutes there. Okay, it shows about eighty-eight percent. So. Uh, expect within six months to one year uh, they will be implementing more UDOs which is uh, pretty exciting uh, you know once you start getting a good plan so th these perils that I'm describing you have to consider those as well so one thing to be uh, aware of whenever you're going to get into the this realm you bring in your teams, make sure your security folks are involved as well as your audit teams because it's great to build this incredible infrastructure only to find out that there's a violation of something or the company's data or financials would be in peril somehow. So be very aware and bring in the right people up front. Don't bring them at the back end because it's much harder to try to correct changes after they've been implemented there. And actually, since we're, uh, I'm sorry, I guess I skipped over that, but just out of also curiosity, because as we're going over the potential for fraud, according to the Association of Certified Fraud Examiners Report 2020, let us uh, say, do you have a Joe or a Steve in your organization? Those two gentlemen that I described up front there, you don't have to answer that one, but it's one of those that if you think in your mind how easy it is for someone to be in your organization and they uh, and you're unaware. Well, that's an interesting number there. Okay, we'll give that a couple more seconds there. As you can see on screen there, there's uh, some statistics from uh, how occupational fraud is concealed. 50-50. Uh, okay, we have a very uh, glass half empty, half full crowd here. We're at 50-50 right now. So it's about a minute. So we have 50-50 yes and no. Uh, nobody declined to answer because sometimes, you know, we, we say, I should know better. But that's very interesting about 50-50 that yes, 50% uh, think that they have a Joe in there or Steve in the organization. 50% are pretty sure we do not. We should always have a little bit of a uh, thought that, hmm, let's look at um, how occupational fraud is concealed. And if we, uh, as we see on the on the presentation here again, uh, the Association of Certified Fraud Examiners, the 2020 reports, the report on all nations, they do an extensive uh, analysis of several thousand cases of fraud that are reported. Uh, the two previous cases that I cited uh, were not reported by the organizations, uh, and basically it's because when you admit to some sort of fraud, it's an SEC filing, it's a report to the SEC which does get back to your stock. And then when you're a publicly traded company, you have a much higher burden to worry about. And that's, you know, they just uh, parted ways with those uh, gentlemen and uh, quietly just said, you know, took whatever losses they had, which they didn't know how bad it was. 
but we go back to our, our slide here as occupational fraud is concealed 40 percent of the frauds are committed with uh, fraudulent physical documents that is anybody with a home computer can create a document a doc receipt a, a shipping invoice anything and they can create fraud with that 36 percent again we go back to our altered physical documents for example the checks that you alter a check you can scan a check and reprint the check and that's um, an, um, another way of uh, you know creating fraud and uh, I know this doesn't add up to 100 percent but these can be used in combination like uh, creating fraud documents and then altering electronics so you can mix and match to you know you can get 100 percent of all the different types of activities you know 27 percent being altered electronic documents or files uh, you know you can literally buy a house without seeing sitting in an office with anybody you can wire transfer money and you can sign papers e-signature e you can buy a house how difficult is that you know if you're trying to just take a lawn mower or some other small objects of uh, value with electronic documents or files so again this world is changing that we have to be very aware of these things and 26 percent would be created with fraudulent electronic files or documents you know any kind of uh, funny documents that you can do electronically if you have a computer that could you could file and send somebody an invoice out of thin air and you can build a case to to get money from them uh, so it's something to be very aware of there's you know these are very devious and uh, some of these are very sophisticated attacks as well and obviously on the bottom there we have 12 percent did not involve any attempts to conceal fraud those <clears throat> tend to be more short-lived but uh, some of these fraud um, escapades can be months or years so the 12 percent one it's a small one but that would be your um, um, much more uh, gruff or on the dock <laughs> uh, kind of events that happens or in the, the, the warehouse or whatever but you know just be aware of the different types of fraud how they're uh, these are the leading types of how fraud is can be perpetuated at the business and, and then. okay now we say who commits fraud here uh, the guys have it you know 72 percent of fraud is committed by men and the average loss is about one hundred fifty thousand dollars for for their uh, events the females you know have the other 28 percent and it's about eighty five thousand dollars even though it's a, such a small minority the dollars are higher per capita than the women for interestingly enough because it's about half the value of men and it's about a third of the population that's you know 72 percent to the 28 percent so losses could be incurred from either sex so something to be aware of um, we we don't know um, the next uh, box there is we have owners and executive uh, they commit about 20 percent of occupational fraud but they also cause the, the largest losses because of their proximity and access to data and to the money you know so the average owner executive was about six hundred thousand dollars of fraud uh, the managers, on the other hand, you know, a little further down the chain, it's only about 150,000 because of the access that they might have. And at the bottom end is an employee, which is about, and this is median numbers, obviously, $60,000 is a substantial still number of, of uh, loss for, the, for fraud from there. <clears throat> and as we move over a little bit more, we have uh, more than half of all occupational frauds come from these four departments which is interesting should be a kind of eye-opening how where we can focus some things you know operations is about 15 percent of the fraud you know operations in your warehouse anywhere in distribution and anything that's an operation related those would be your hands-on kind of people 14 percent would be your accounting so people going back to our uh, joe 
he's writing checks to himself or to whomever he wants to split the money with. They can write a check to uh, a friend opens an LLC and they write checks to that LLC and they disappear. So that's a uh, 14%, that's pretty su substantial as well. Uh, you have executive and upper management, which is 12%. And uh, not to be forgotten, we have our sales force uh, with 11%. And you, we think, you know, for example, travel and expenses, those are hidden bugs in there that a great deal of money could be moved through there under the guise of travel or expenses expenses for all types of things. So we have to monitor those things and be very aware of the fraud that can uh, be, that come from those things. And and then some possible things to consider. There's tools and activities that we can use to monitor these types of activities, right? <clears throat> For example, if your organization has a group solely to add, change, delete uh, address book entries, for example, that's a good control. You can consider a master data management. That group, that's all that they do. And it'll be sacred. Nobody else can touch that those that data. Uh, depending on the, how big your organization, yeah, that that might be difficult to do because you might have you know the, the the chief bottle washer, candlestick maker, shoe person, all the same person. So sometimes this could be difficult to, to parse out that way. <clears throat> and a big uh, I should have put this all in caps here, but uh, this is not just for the publicly traded companies who need to monitor for fraud. This is all for, also for private entities. And there's a host of reasons why you want your, your private companies to be as healthy financially and meet the same criteria that the big publicly traded companies are for a host of reasons. And in today's environment, for example, if you have a company and for example, you're the older or originator, founder of the company you want to sell, you need to fall into the guidelines of what publicly traded companies do if you're going to merge or tra transact with somebody else. <clears throat> if your security is a mess, it makes your, your value that much less. It's like keeping your house nice and pretty and painted and everything for the homeowners association. The same thing with your company. You want to make sure that you can pass any review. So this is just not for the publicly traded guys that have to worry about that. Your private people should have to, you know, same concerns and same Guard, uh, guards that we have to provide because you know shrinkage you know lost money is lost money no matter if you're private or public you know there's still somebody's uh, can take advantage of those uh, situations <clears throat> you know highly encouraged to get your business users and your audit teams and security to train and to be aware of potential fraud and misuse of the company uh, assets and data And you should have, uh, you know, things like a tip line, you know, a whistleblower, fraud alert kind of stuff where people are aware because if you're working in, in an organization and you know that there might be mischief afoot, well, that job is also yours because if the whole company goes down, you, you're going to be punished as well. You won't have a job as well. So it's in everybody's best interest that we do take that seriously and protect the organization. So, so real quick summary here. Um, we have uh, UDOs. They offer powerful, very powerful tools to enhance your business productivity and ease of of functions for the the end users. So instead of uh, you give them exact again, you give them exactly what they need and nothing they don't. It makes it easy. It makes it much more simple for them. <clears throat> and before we, we rush ahead with sharing these powerful tools. You know, get audit or security administration opinion for any possibility of risk or exposure. <clears throat> and that's why I say if it's a project, you could start creating UDOs. Have a team, a SWAT team type that will review that and say, what are we opening up? What are we exposing? Do we need to do that? And and again, this is very important if you have a, an SOD conflict issue. Those are be very aware and GXP or GMP for manufa good manufacturing processes. You can have 
government entities who watch over you, you know, the, for example, the FDA, you know, if you're in, in food or in drugs. So any of kinds of those areas, you have to be very keen to what uh, was being exposed. And uh, third is uh, review your current situation because it does need to be, uh, does it need to be updated to ensure the risks are mitigated? You know, just because you have an existing process that's been working fantastic for all these years, we don't have to see it because it runs. So if it works, don't bother it. Uh, no, I would encourage people, and you should encourage your teams, can we improve? What are we doing here? Is there something that, are we doing extra work that we don't need to? That's a benefit right there because you're going to make it more efficient. But also, are we exposing ourselves because the just the different landscape as we're experiencing, can we make this more secure? Because you never know. Things might have been put in by someone who was in a hurry, and that was five years ago, but it still runs. Nobody bothers to go back and double check. Uh, and one of my favorite stories is <clears throat> we had an, uh, one client that nobody knew RPG, so they'd bring in RPG contractors. <clears throat> and one of my uh, colleagues was looking through the code, and, and he was kind of curious as, who wrote this RPG? And it was an employee number, so and so. Well, the HR gentleman was not happy because that person wrote RPG uh, code to accrue his vacation time quicker than everybody else. So he was able to cash checks out much sooner, and um, nobody could read the code, so it, it was a mystery to everybody. So again, just because something's been in place for a long time doesn't mean it's still safe and effective and it's still <clears throat> correct for your organization. So question those things. Don't let them languish out there. And <clears throat> now we have a call for action opportunity here. Uh, this is just for the webcast attendees. That's just you that's on the, the list right there. Here at GSI, we could do a security review for you for uh, this webinar price of uh, $49.95. And this will just be good for until July 30th. We can review your security architecture, menus, roles, and compliance issues. We'll document your findings and offer recommendations because we can run reporting against your existing security and see if you have, for example, uh, SOX compliance issues. If you're publicly traded and you're going through current audits, you may already have that resolved. But if you're private, maybe you should have somebody, you know, take a double peek across it. And also, depending on what kind of tools you're using, you might have gaps that are un unknown to anybody who's looking for it. Because, uh, again, if it's working, you tend to not dig too far down into it. If it's... Uh, our interest is to dig all the way down there and find all the answers because we want to root out anything that we can uh, come across. So this is just a one time one time for uh, all of you on the webinar. Now it's one time fee. This is a this is a pretty valuable uh, review that would also give you some good standing with uh, audit teams that say that we had a review done by uh, you know the export organization. And uh, this is uh, the findings, if there were any. If you're a clean bill of health, even better. But uh, this is just an opportunity that here you can take advantage of this one. And, and with that, I'll turn it back over to uh, Brittany. Thank awesome. you very much, Brittany. Thank you. Um, let me, I think, okay. All right, thanks, David. And now I'm just gonna follow, um, I have a few things to follow up with and we'll move on to our question and answers section. GSI provides extensive free educational resources, including our weekly educational webcast, our monthly newsletter called the GSI Insider, online resource center where you can access our on-demand webcasts, white papers, etc., YouTube, on-site, and virtual workshop. If you would like to sign up for our weekly email reminders for upcoming webcasts, our monthly newsletter, or to create an account to access our resource center, go to getgsi.com. Go to resources and events on the main menu, and then you'll just select JD Edwards and the appropriate link on the right. Check our erptalk.com, which is our problem solving forum where you can get your JD Edwards and other enterprise application questions answered, 
as well as contribute your answers to others' questions. Stay connected with us on social media. All of our handles are currently listed on the screen. You can see our most up-to-date posts on webcast, events, industry insights, and so much more. All right, and now we will move on to the Q&A session. Um, while I see that we've had a couple of questions already submitted, if you would still like to submit a question, you can do so um, using the questions panel and the GoToWebinar console window on the right side of your screen. If you minimize your console earlier, please just click the right left arrow to redisplay the questions panel. And our first question today is from Alex. Um, the question is, my organization is spread out across multiple geographical sites. With minimum staffing at these sites, they must perform tasks from HR to shipping. How would you address that? <clears throat> That's a very interesting question. And uh, I do have an example of uh, one client that I was at. They were on the West Coast and they were seasonal. Uh, they would have small shops in Alaska, for example. And uh, they would have, because of the weather and all that, they'd have small uh, groups of people show up, so they would do everything. I would highly recommend, if you have that kind of distributed organization, start to consolidate, for example, your procurement people. Have a team that does your procurement. <clears throat> and going back to the, the gentleman, Steve, when he did the, the website, have people order up, you know, have a common, for example, everybody gets the red stapler <clears throat> or, you know, whatever items. So you consolidate that so you also can leverage better buying power because you're, you're centralizing your, your procurement and any other functions. As far as your systems as well, <clears throat> if you have uh, separate instances of Enterprise One, for example, those are very tough, but you should try to bring that together so you have a common database for everything. Don't, don't um, even though they're separate, remove some of those duties from those because when you have a small shop in Madrid and they do everything there, you can uh, run into SOD issues even though it's offshore from the US because you SODs are still affecting them because if you're a US-based company, the SODs would affect, you know, any violations there would be effective on the U.S. Uh, part of the organization. So try to centralize and bring those uh, parts in because if they're small entities, then it's easy enough to be able to absorb whatever workload they might have into a central office. <clears throat> they might be able to justify additional staff, you know, headcounts on at your main headquarters for that. Awesome. Okay. Thank you. Um, and our next question is from Linda. I work for a privately held business and was interested in the title of the webinar for UDO usage. Did you not expect this content? What value is there to revamp our review process? And that's a great question. That's what I, I tried to bring up there. Because even though if you're a private entity, you should have some sort of review that's much maybe more rigorous than what you're currently doing uh, especially in, in today's environment if there's any mergers takeovers and so forth you want to have your financials all of your security everything that meets up to the stuff that everybody else is going through the the accounting board uh, people you know the pwc's the and the uh the auditing firms you want to meet up to their standards because that's going to show a clean bill of health for you. So even though you're private, dig in there because because uh, you can accept you know three percent loss for due to shrinkage of your computer parts or your your uh, silver recovery or anything like that. But is, can that three percent come down to one? You know that's saving money by taking away anything that people can cheat on. You make it much more difficult. So you could have a much better. Uh, results in your, your inf positively influence your bottom line there. And it was gonna interest, one of the other interesting uh, factors that brought up from the, uh, the, so, uh, the Association of Certified uh, Fraud Examiners, <clears throat> there's about a 22%, oh, I'm sorry, 9% chance of somebody within one year of committing fraud in the company. 
If the person's tenure is within one to five years, it goes up to 46%. So somebody who's used and comfortable with the organization is more adept at committing fraud. And you think after five years, you know, they they bring cookies every Friday and all that, they're a great person. But yeah, underneath the covers, they might be doing something else that the temptation is there and it's easy enough, They'll, they could do that. And that's what you see that in private end companies, but those things get hidden much more for whatever reasons that they do that. But, um, you know, that's why I think you should bring your standards up to whatever the the big companies use because that, that is only going to help you. It's a little more money, but yes, the, your dollars spent will be good dollars. You're not going to throw, you know, good dollars after bad. You're throwing good dollars after better dollars. And that's at the end of the day, that's what you want. Okay. Thank you, David. Um, that appears to be the end of our questions today. Thank you everyone for your questions. If you do have any follow-up questions, you can send them into info at gsi.com and we will get back to you. Um, we also have some other ways to contact us here on the screen. You can go to our website um, and there's also our phone number here. We'll get back to you. As a follow-up from today's webcast, we ask that you complete a short one-minute survey when you exit. You will be receiving an email with a link to our resource center on our website where you can access the recording from today's webcast as well as the copy of the presentation. After today's webcast, we will do the drawing for the $25 Amazon gift card. Anyone that attended the entire webcast will be eligible. We will then notify the winner. Um, and we thank you again for attending the presentation today. We hope you have a great day. Thank you. Thanks, David.